no, 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 no test, test. All right, we're going to get started. Welcome back. If we could settle down. So just a quick announcement tonight, actually, in Salomon 101, there's a great event, um, SACNES, so y'all should come. Uh, great speakers, panel discussion on women in STEM. So I'll be there. So, okay, so today you're going to maybe sense a little change in flavor of the lecture. We're going to start to integrate lectures together. Um, think about bigger pictures. Uh, and so the fundamental thing that we're doing today is building sugar molecules from smaller, um, smaller molecules, three carbon sugars up to six carbon sugars. It's a process called gluconeogenesis. And we'll be looking at ways in which the enzymes involved in this process as well as regulation. Uh, and then we'll think a little bit about storage of glucose and how that's regulated, both the synthesis of starch as well as the degradation of starch. So we're going to be sort of dancing in between anabolism and catabolism throughout today. And then the last part of the lecture, to make the next lecture just slightly palatable, we're going to put a little bit of that in here. So we're going to do the catabolic uh, pathways that process fats or fatty acids. And so this is a big picture of where we're at. So yesterday or on uh, in the last lecture, uh, we looked at uh, the Calvin cycle. Remember, 3-phosphoglycerate um, could be fed into uh, these pathways. And so there's a little highlighting there of synthesis of larger sugars from uh, this 3-carbon sugar. And so uh, we know that uh, in anaerobic uh, cells, you have uh, conversion of pyruvate to lactate. But as it turns out, that enzyme is actually reversible depending on the the true cellular state, delta G. So if lactate builds up, we can run that in reverse. And you'll see how the Krebs cycle is instrumental participant uh, in these pathways, receiving all kinds of catabolic degradation products and then feeding them into synthesis of uh, glucose and glucose-like molecules. And so just as a highlight, in lecture 15 coming up in a little while, we're going to bring everything together in terms of organ systems. And so there might be a little bit of lack of detail on that subject today. And, and sort of the, the idea, why do we need to synthesis, synthesize glucose? That will become much more clear in a later lecture. But today we're just going to focus on the process itself. So remember when we looked at glycolysis, uh, and there's a variety of, uh, of steps that are rate limiting. Remember, these are these valve functions. They're effectively irreversible. So we had uh, hexokinase, PFK1, uh, and pyruvate kinase. And so all of these had a very large uh, delta G prime knot as well as a large uh, standard cha chain or large cellular uh, delta G. And so if uh, we don't know yet why we need to make glucose, but um, th it is true that we do need to make glucose. So if we're going to do that, we obviously can't just go straight up the same list of uh, enzymes that we used before because these steps are irreversible. So we're going to need alternative pathways that are also uh, thermodynamically favorable to get around these, uh, reverse or these irreversible steps. And so here is the big picture. So you have the catabolic processing of sugars, glycolysis, uh, synthesis of pyruvate. Remember, pyruvate is then imported into the mitochondria. Uh, so today we're going to be taking pyruvate and working our way back up uh, to glucose. And these are these, these bypass reactions. So instead of going in the reverse direction uh, in a very unfavorable uh, enzyme, we're going to go through a totally different enzyme. Uh, and um, that's how we're going to get around these troubles. Okay, and so we're going to go through these steps one at a time. Uh, and to understand them at a deeper level. So, so this slide is a little bit confusing. So the majority of uh, gluconeogenesis does occur in the cytosol, but one of that first bypass reaction, um, conversion to pyruvate to PEP, that involves both the cytosol and the mitochondria. And this is the forward direction in glycolysis. Remember the conversion of PEP to uh, pyruvate uh, with pyruvate kinase. 
this is effectively irreversible. Um, so you'd think it would be just a one step, maybe a, you know, so here we're going uh, you know, from this state up to this state. You, know, you would think that could be just a simple step to get you there. Um, but like some of the rigmarole that we did with photorespiration, there's actually a lot of steps to get back from pyruvate uh, to PEP. Now, this is confusing because um, there's two different ways to get from pyruvate to PEP, and it depends on the type of tissue and whether lactic acid is available. When lactic acid is available, we can grab uh, some of the electrons from lactic acid and make a reduced cofactor. So if you look at the, the previous slide, you'll see to go in the reverse direction, in the forward direction, we made NADH, but in the reverse direction, we need NADH. So we have to have some way to get some NADH in the cytosol. Typically, NADH co concentration are much higher in the mitochondria than the cytosol. So there's two ways we can do that. If we have lactate, we can take the electrons from lactate, stick them on NAD to make NADH. Okay. The other way to do it is to export NADH from the mitochondria using a carrier. So we transfer those electrons uh, to oxaloacetate, make malate, malate's transported out, and then we have the same enzyme but a cytosolic version working in the reverse direction to transfer those electrons back to NADH. And remember, this is towards the end, remember the Krebs cycle, this is towards the end where there's a pretty good equilibrium here, so it's definitely a reversible process. And so uh, in uh, muscle cells or other cells experiencing high levels of lactate, um, we can regenerate our NADH directly in the cytosol. But then we need to convert uh, to PEP. So there's two enzymes involved. One of these uh, we've already uh, have seen uh, before, uh, and that's this pyruvate carboxylase. Remember, we're taking pyruvate as a three-carbon molecule and oxaloacetate is a four-carbon molecule. Uh, and then uh, we can then use this second enzyme, this carboxykinase. Remember, we need a phosphorylation there, and we need a three-carbon sugar to get to PEP. So there's transporters in the cell, both in animal cells, both for malate and PEP. Now, uh, plant cells actually have transporters for oxaloacetate, but we don't have that, so we need to convert the molecules into some other form to be able to get them back out of the mitochondria. And you can see these are the same enzymes here, right? So you've got this PEP carboxykinase. This is a cytosolic version. This is a mitochondrial version. Okay, so there's two different ways that we can do this first bypass reaction. So let's look at the individual steps. Um, and this is what I said, you need to get NA, you need some way to make NADH. So if you're doing an anaerobic respiration, you're going to have a high level of lactic acid. Uh, and so then we can just grab our electrons from lactate. Um, but in other cells, um, you can actually export um, the, uh, NADH, effectively export without actually moving the molecule. So you hitch the ride of the electrons on a carrier and then redeposit them on NAD to make NADH. Okay, so here's the first step. Where did we see this step before? Does this look familiar? So we have pyruvate, and we're synthesizing oxaloacetate. Do you remember? Anaplerotic reactions, right? So this is a three-carbon molecule getting converted to a four-carbon molecule. And so one of the reasons for anaplerotic reactions is, you know, anytime you siphon off a metabolite to an anabolic process, the level of all the Krebs cycle intermediates is decreased. But here we're sort of showing both sides. We're the filling up reaction, and then the next step, we're going to be taking oxaloacetate equivalents out of the cell. Okay, and so we're using these existing mechanisms, existing enzymes, um, to feed into gluconeogenesis. So remember, this is biotin. It can, uh, catalyzes the tautomerization uh, of pyruvate to this form, which is much more reactive to carbon dioxide. This is the same exact slides, just a review. Uh, and so we're going to make this uh, four-carbon molecule oxaloacetate from pyruvate using this enzyme. And so this uh, enzyme is regulated by acetyl-CoA. So now you have to put on your sort of integrative uh, cap and think about why might we want to use, what kind of reporting or indication is provided by a buildup 
of acetyl-CoA. What does that tell you about the rate of the Krebs cycle in terms of compared to the rate of feeding into the Krebs cycle? So that indicates the input is much higher than the generation of energy. So a high acetyl-CoA level indicates a high energy charge. Remember in the previous lecture, I, I gave you this idea of energy charge? So the concentration of ATP is very high relative to other molecules. So it's a surrogate marker of energy charge. So you could use ATP or you could use AMP in an inverse sort of way. Or you could use acetyl-CoA. It's telling you, you know, the cell is just stuffed full of energy. We don't need any more Krebs cycle. So it's a surrogate marker. And so what we're doing here is we're exporting again, uh, reducing equivalents um, to uh, the cytosol where we need them because we're going to push glycolysis in reverse. So that um, the, one of the dehydrogenase enzymes is going to need as a substrate NADH. Okay, so this is the first step. And the second step uh, in the first bypass reaction uh, is this PEP carboxykinase. Right, and so we're going to remove a CO2 going from a four carbon oxaloacetate to a three carbon PEP, and we're also going to be adding a phosphorylation. That's what's necessary. Okay, and so this is a favorable process, thermodynamically speaking. So overall, if you look at both of these steps, uh, you're converting pyruvate to PEP, but you're using both an ATP and a GTP equivalent. So it turns out that this PEP carboxykinase prefers GTP, and ATP is, is preferred uh, by this pyruvate carboxylase. So remember, pyruvate kinase is just making an ATP. So we're losing energy here by going in the reverse direction. We're using both an ATP and a GTP. Okay, so we're expending energy to go. And this, you know, it sort of makes sense that uh, pyruvate is a less energetic molecule of phospholinyl pyruvate. Okay. Does that make sense so far? So this is our first, by, first of three bypass reactions. Questions? Okay, so the second bypass uh, reaction is this conversion of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. So all the other enzymes up to this step are exactly the same as glycolysis. Remember, those are working right around delta G of zero. So you just feed molecules in at the bottom, and those will make it all the way up to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. But now, this PFK1 step in the glycolysis direction was too exergonic, exergonic to be reversible. So instead of transferring this phosphate back to an ADP, we just release it to solution, right? And so that's exergonic because you have the increased resonance of the phosphate and you have less negative charges in this molecule. But it's not exergonic enough to synthesize an ATP molecule. So we're losing energy here as well, going in the reverse direction, okay? And so this is just a simple hydrolysis catalyzed by this fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase 1. Okay. And so the forward direction is PFK1. And then this is our third body pass. So remember, hexokinase was converting glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. Uh, and so we're doing the same exact strategy again. There's just not enough energy to take this phosphate and put it on an ADP molecule. So, but there is enough energy to just hydrolyze this phosphate off, lowering the activation barrier with the enzyme. So it's a delta G prime naught is exergonic. Okay, so these are, and, and you'll notice that these bypass reactions are very exergonic. They're effectively irreversible. Okay, you with me so far? These are three bypass reactions here. You have those two enzymes and this interplay with the mitochondria. But these are all in the cytosol. These are all the exact same enzymes. You're just pushing things in the backwards direction by building up some PEP. And then you get to this step, the second bypass reaction, and the third bypass reaction. Okay, so this is how we synthesize from pyruvate uh, a molecule of glucose. 
And so we can either make glucose and export it from the cell. It's a great way to transport some sugar around. But we can also use the glucose 6-phosphate um, to make starch. So we can skip one of these bypass reactions if we're um, just making starch. OK, so let's look at the overall process. Say, you know, what would it take to take glucose all the way down to pyruvate, then all the way back up to glucose? So let's look at, so this is the gluconeogenic, the upwards direction. So you have pyruvates going to glucose. You have ATPs, GTPs, and NADHs. Um, being converted to ADPs, GDPs, and NADs. So glucose, remember the summary of that is you're just synthesizing two ATP molecules and two NADHs, reduced cofactors. So if you sum these two equations together, you know, things on opposite sides get, get deleted, you end up with just hydrolyzing ATPs and GTPs. And so this overall, if you go from, obviously, this is a bad thing. You don't want to go from glucose to pyruvate back to glucose and around and around and around. You'll just be generating heat. So you'll just be hydrolyzing ATPs and GTPs. Each circuitous route that you make, um, you'll be wasting an ATP and a GTP molecule. And so these bypass reactions need to be coordinately regulated. So when one direction is on, the other direction has to be off to prevent this waste of energy. But what does that mean, reciprocally regulated? I, there's some last-minute order change in the slides, if you did. It's just go a few slides ahead. Um, so here you have catabolic processes, such as uh, glycolysis, and you're making ATPs and NADHs and other reduced cofactors. And then the gluconeogenesis is an example of an anabolic pathway. We're taking ATP, NADH, uh, and GTP to synthesize a larger molecule, a glucose molecule. And so the direction, you don't want this to go in a circle, or you just needlessly hydrolyze ATPs. You just waste energy. And so you need, with high energy charge, in other words, when the levels of ATP are much higher than ADP or AMP, you need to go in the anabolic direction. That means we don't need to burn any more glucose. Might as well store some up in starch. Whereas if the levels of ATP are dropping, usually the typical average level is about tenfold excess of ATP over uh, ADP and AMP. So if it drops much below that, then this pathway needs to turn on so that we can feed more uh, pyruvate and acetyl-CoA into the Krebs cycle to make more energy. Okay, so there's this delicate balance here depending on the energy charge in the cell. So remember, this is the exact same slide I showed before. We calculate the energy charge by the summation of all adenylates with various phosphates. So we have ATP, the ADP form, and the AMP form. And then we have the useful forms of those molecules that can push anabolic processes forward. In other words, ATP or ADP, which you can think of as an ATP equivalent because AD, two ADP molecules can be converted into one ATP. So really an ADP is just half of, uh, or half an ADP is equivalent to uh, an ATP, right? Or half an ATP is equivalent to an ADP, stated correctly. Okay, so this is this, we're going to come back to this concept of energy charge again and again and again. So there's really two things going on here. We need to sense the energy charge in the cell, but we also need to sense the levels of glucose. So energy charge has a lot to do with what you're doing, you know. So if you're running around, you're going to be using up energy. And the levels of glucose have to do with intake as well as utilization, right? So there's sort of independent parameters. So we don't want to have any of these futile cycles. Like, so we only want to make glucose if we need, if we're short on glucose. Right? And we only want to do glycolysis when we need some energy. OK, so let's look at this. So you might wonder, OK, so we need to respond to these two independent. They seem sort of connected, right? But in reality, you know, if you just sit in the couch and drink, you know, sugary beverages, you know, your energy charge is going to be high and glucose is going to be high, right? So we need to coordinately regulate these things to sense two different things, the energy charge, the levels of glucose. 
And so this, is, this regulation occurs at the irreversible steps. So remember, we already talked about PFK1. Remember, that's a good place. That's better than hexokinase because some of those feeder pathways feed in um, below hexokinase, but above PFK1, right? So this is a good place to regulate glycolysis. And here we have a molecule AMP. So you can see that obviously is a energy charge sensor. Okay, so if AMP levels are high, um, that means ATP levels are low, right? And so that, would, that means we need to make some more ATPs. We've got to reduce the amount of AMP by converting it into ATP. Okay, but on the other hand, this reverse direction, this phosphatase that removes a phosphate from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, well, if the uh, level is AMP is high, we need to inhibit this reverse process. We don't want to have this circle going on here. Okay, so this is just sensing energy charge. And we already talked about, there's some redundancy here, right? So ATP is sensed, uh, ADP, and citrate, remember, is to help us synchronize glycolysis and the Krebs cycle to have those be at a similar rate. But how do we sense glucose? Okay, so this is this mysterious molecule just appears out of nowhere, fructose 2 6 bisphosphate. So that's different than fructose 1 6 bisphosphate. And so fructose 2 6 bisphosphate uh, turns on glycolysis and turns off gluconeogenesis. And this is done by allosteric regulation of these two different enzymes. Okay, and so remember what, when we talked about allosteric regulators and how you could have these heterotrophic allosteric regulators, and these could be negative or positive. They could affect either the Km or the Vmax of the enzymes. So for example, here is PFK1. So at, in the presence of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, wherever it came from, um, you have the Km uh, being decreased, or you should say, in terms of an allosteric regulator, the K.5 is decreased because they're sigmoidal curves. Whereas in the absence of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, um, this enzyme has a much lower apparent binding affinity. Remember, there's an inverse to the Km or K.5 in terms of binding affinity. Okay, so PFK1 is turned on in the presence of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and um, turned off in its absence. And here is this other enzyme, this phosphatase, fructose bisphosphatase 1. And so in the presence of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, that's turned off. And in the absence, it's turned on. It's the exact opposite of this other enzyme. So the allosteric regulator, fructose 2,6-phosphate, binds at a site other than the active site, changing the conformation in order to make the catalysis at the active site more or less favorable. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward so far. And here's a little picture of the molecule here, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, similar to the glycolytic molecule. Okay, so here we have uh, this molecule coordinately regulating. So when you have fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, PFK1 is turned on, and fructose bisphosphatase is turned off. Okay, so at high levels of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, to recap, glycolysis is increased, gluconeogenesis is inhibited. At low levels of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, glycolysis is inhibited, and gluconeogenesis is induced. Okay, you with me so far? But there's an obvious question, where did this thing come from? It just came from above and indicated glucose. There's some, I've told you that it's a glucose sensor. But what does that mean? How is it sensing? Okay, so let's look at this a little more. This is the enzyme. Confusing names here. These enzymes make an allosteric regulator. They're not part of glycolysis. They're part of regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is made by PFK2, different than PFK1. And fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate is cleaved to fructose 6 uh, phosphate for fructose bisphosphatase 2, different than fructose bisphosphatase 1. Same sort of chemistry, right? You've got ATP going in this direction, and you've got just hydrolysis of inorganic phosphate in this direction. Okay? Does that make sense? 
Isn't it annoying? It's like, it actually, the structures look nothing at all similar. Okay, and so this, this PFK2 and FBPase2 are actually one polypeptide, a protein with two domains. The other one, PFK1 and FBPase1, are not just one polypeptide with two domains. So here you have one domain is a kinase, and the other domain is a phosphatase. Okay? Which one is which? Looking at the happy picture. And why? Should we turn on the clicker? <laughs> which one is which? Well, so one of them has something in there, right? One of them has something. Does that look like an inorganic phosphate? Well, maybe. There's like an adenine hanging out here. So that's got to be the kinase. Okay? You with me? This is, this is like layers here that we're building up. It's a little confusing. I'm going to summarize in the next slide. Okay, so we're making fructose 2,6-bisphosphate by these two uh, enzymes are regulating the abundance of this molecule. We have a phosphatase and we have a kinase. It's a dual function, single polypeptide with two domains. And here is everything. And we're going to go through this, and I'm going to try not to reverse things. Okay, like I did last year. Okay, <laughs> so you have one regulated, regulating molecule making two-domain enzyme, single polypeptide. You've got PFK2 um, and FBPase2. And now we're going to add just one more layer onto this. So we're going to have a phosphorylated version of this two-domained enzyme, and we're going to have an unphosphorylated version. Now remember, this is actually phosphorylation of the polypeptide. And so when we have phosphorylation of this thing, the phosphatase activity is on, and the kinase activity is off. And when it's dephosphorylated, the kinase activity is on, and the phosphatase activity is off. Okay, and so in this state, we're making fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And so in this state, we're turning on glycolysis, turning off gluconeogenesis. In this state, we're cleaving the, the phosphate off the bisphosphate molecule, and we're removing fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which has the effect of turning glycolysis off and tur turning gluconeogenesis on. And so the oscillation between the two activity states of this dual domain enzyme is mediated by, obviously, a kinase and a phosphatase. In this case, we're talking about a protein kinase and a protein phosphatase. So the phosphatase removes the phosphate, favoring glycolysis, disfavoring gluconeogenesis, and the kinase adds the phosphate, uh, and this is uh, turning off glycolysis and turning on gluconeogenesis. And this, this is where the sensing of glucose occurs. It occurs right here with this hormone insulin. So insulin is produced in your pancreas as a response to glucose being present. So if glucose is present, insulin is present. And if insulin is present, we shift this enzyme to this form, turning glycolysis on. We want glycolysis if glucose is present. Turning gluconeogenesis off. Now, in the absence of glucose, your pancreas makes glucagon. And glucagon shifts the enzyme to this form, removing the regulatory molecule fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, turning off glycolysis, and turning on gluconeogenesis. If we don't have glucose, might as well make some more. We need to, you know, your body needs a certain level of glucose, and so if we're running low on glucose, and perhaps we don't have, we're not drinking sugary beverages, we don't have any sugars coming into our diet, well, we need a certain level of glucose. Your brain dies without glucose. You have to have glucose in your body. Okay, does this make, this is a very confusing slide, because there's layer upon layer upon layer of regulation. Okay? Does it make any sense? Any questions on this? Yes? Is it 
So that occurs in the pancreas. So there's receptors uh, in the pancreas that um, cause the pancreas to produce insulin, so these beta islet cells. So we'll look at that a little bit more in lecture 15 as well. Okay. You with me so far? I I explained it well. (laughs) No. Really? I did it this year? Cool. Okay, I'm going to move on before you ask any questions. Okay. So, we have a decision. Now it gets really, your mind is a little bit warped, but now I'm going to take you to a whole new level. So we have pyruvate, and pyruvate is the decision point. You might say, what about acetyl-CoA? Could that be a decision point? So pyruvate can be, through gluconeogenesis, converted into glucose, or pyruvate in the mitochondria through pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, a uh, irreversible step can be converted to acetyl-CoA, which feeds into the Krebs cycle. And so acetyl-CoA, remember, that's our happy surrogate marker of energy charge. And so if we have enough energy, no need for um, pyruvate uh, to be converted to acetyl-CoA, you know, because we already have enough energy. Might as well store that, the energy in that pyruvate in a glucose molecule. So starch is just a beautiful way to store energy when you have enough. So acetyl-CoA, our surrogate marker of charge, is giving us a sense of how backed up the citric acid cycle is. Okay? And so this has one direction. Is, you can't have them both going on, right? That would be confusing. You have one direction on, one direction off. But acetyl-CoA, can that be converted into glucose? Think about it. So acetyl-CoA, this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, is effectively irreversible. Remember, we spent had that beautiful slide. It's got this massive, what is it, five megadalton mega complex thing. And that thing has got all kinds of regulation, uh, and that is effectively irreversible. So, you know, we're not going to be going this way from acetyl-CoA, but maybe we could do some other more circuitous route. We'll think about that. Let's think about this. So one of the ways that you can make glucose and gluconeogenesis is by converting amino acids into glucose. So these are called glucogenic amino acids because they can be catabolized to these simple um, molecules that are involved in the Krebs cycle. So each of these amino acids listed can be converted into either pyruvate, alpha-ketoglutarate, oxirate, fumarate, succinyl-CoA. And remember, as, long, as soon as you convert any of these amino acids to one of these Krebs cycle intermediates, they're all interchanged, at least these guys, right? There's a cycle. So you make one, you've made them all. And you feed into the Krebs cycle every molecule you can feed in. You can feed out to make a glucose molecule. Okay, but let's think about this. So from pyruvate, you can take these amino acids, uh, uh, convert them to pyruvate, and then up gluconeogenesis to uh, glucose. And citrate, and we can also siphon, we can have these amino acids coming in at various places in the citric acid cycle, and those can be converted to oxaloacetate. Remember, our, our bypass reaction involved oxaloacetate. And so that can feed into gluconeogenesis. But acetyl-CoA absolutely cannot be converted into glucose. Think about that for a minute. So it's obvious, you know, it's not just going to go pyruvate dehydrogenase backwards. That's effectively irreversible. But what about going forwards into Krebs cycle and being converted into oxaloacetate? Why wouldn't that work? Let me show you the picture. So why can't I just take acetyl-CoA, convert it to oxaloacetate, and then pull that off and make some glucose? Why? I did not understand this as a student after taking biochemistry class, so I think maybe some of you might not understand this. Why not? Where are my friends that got 100 points on the exam? <laughs> Uh-oh. People are being punched. <laughs> Think about it. Count the, look at it in terms of the, car, the number of carbon atoms. So you might be... Do you get it? 
That's right. So, so you have two coming in, okay, making this molecule. How many carbons in citrate? Six, six, five, four, four, five, four, five, four, five, four, four. Two come in, two come out. The thing that's removed from the Krebs cycle is oxaloacetate, or actually malate is transported out of the mitochondria. And so if you put two in, you have two carbon dioxides coming out, right? There's just, if you take an oxaloacetate, you're minus four, right? So you're sucking, and if, as soon as you remove oxaloacetate, all of the Krebs cycle intermediates decrease. Right? But what about alpha-ketoglutarate? I said that was glucogenic. Why is that one glucogenic, whereas acetyl-CoA is not? Do you see it? How many carbons in alpha-ketoglutarate? Five. Okay. And so what happens if we're going to take off like a malate? One of the carbons goes to carbon dioxide, Four of the carbons come out as malate. It's carbon neutral. Do you see it? So you can't take out acetyl-CoA because you're, it's a minus four when you pull that malate off. But if you come in as alpha-ketoglutarate, five carbons in, one carbon out as CO2, one out as uh, four carbons out as malate. You're not reducing the abundance of any of the intermediates. Does this make sense? And this is why, you know, plants are different than us. I mean, spinach sort of has a lot of similar types of biochemistry, but not this part. In plants, we saw the glyoxylate cycle. We could take two acetyl-CoA's and make an oxaloacetate. Um, but here, we can't do this. We can't go reverse through pyruvate dehydrogenase, and we can't go forward through here because, you know, there's no net. There's a minus four carbons when you try that. So make sure... This is something that's very, very critical. And so these are plants. Remember plants, you could take uh, your two acetyl-CoA molecules and actually make a succinate molecule. And that succinate molecule, uh, four-carbon molecule, can be brought out and fed uh, into the Krebs cycle, filling up the Krebs cycle to help replenish the capacity to do anabolic path pathways that feed off of the Krebs cycle. Okay, so this is why plants have seeds, right? They're full of fats. And we'll learn at the later part of today's lecture how fats can be converted into acetyl-CoA. But fats cannot be converted into glucose. Period. End of discussion. In animal cells. Glycerol can be fed into, into glycolysis, which is part of a fat, but the actual fatty acid itself is converted to acetyl-CoA, can't go reverse through pyruvate dehydrogenase, cannot go forward to malate through the Krebs cycle without causing damage to the Krebs cycle. I mean, it could, but, you know, every molecule you take out, you would reduce the efficiency of the Krebs cycle. You cannot productively feed it through that direction. Okay? And so in plants, you can actually transport oxaloacetate. You don't need to do this malate uh, shuttle that we saw in animal cells, and oxaloacetate can then be converted uh, by this carboxykinase activity into PEP and then into various phosphorylated sugars. Okay? You with me so far? A little break in between. And actually, I have a big announcement. We're halfway done with the class with this slide. Woohoo! <laughs> halfway. Lecture. Whatever, 12. <laughs> Halfway through lecture 12. It gets better.
Let's finish up. Cast your vote. to get going. Throw up an answer. Guess. Hail Mary. Everybody all set? Is the number increasing? Please put something down. All right. Enjoy your rest break. You're halfway through the class rest break. This is an annoying question because there's just a lot of words, right? So you spend half the time like, figuring out which one it is. So there you go. Good job. The correct answer was C. All right. We're going to dive back in. There's a lot coming up. So we've done gluconeogenesis. Woohoo! Now, we need to think about where did this starch thing come from? So remember, glycogen is animal starch, and we have both alpha-1,4 and alpha-1,6 link linkages. We have a bunch of non-reducing ends and a reducing end. But is it really a reducing end? You'll see today the exciting conclusion to that story. So this is how we store glucose. When we have too much glucose and we, our energy charge is good, but the glucose keeps coming in, we need to store that away for a rainy day. And so we're going to make glycogen. This polymer has both these alpha-1,4 linkages, these linear parts, and at each branch point, remember, there's an alpha-1,6 linkage. So this is a review. We're going to review a couple of these. And then generally, it's pretty branched. It's about every 8 to 12 sugar residues is a branching residue. And so plants also have starches. They have uh, amylose, which is uh, this uh, molecule here, uh, or amylopectin, which is very s similar to glycogen. But it's a little bit less lower frequency of branching. Okay, but we're going to focus on uh, the animal starch glycogen. So the, remember the structure is this helical, and every time you have a branch, you have another helical segment coming off. Uh, and so, as I said, amylopectin is a little bit less branched uh, than glycogen. Okay, this is just review, um, just to, to freshen you up. But how do we make this molecule? So the way we make this molecule is take a phosphorylated sugar. This is a very abstract slide. So I'm saying NTP. So this could be any of four bases. And we'll see today, uh, in, in the case of glycogen, we're going to use UDP. Um, so we have some uh, nucleoside triphosphate, and that molecule uh, is going to be literally attached to our sugar. Right? So we're going to make this new phosphoester uh, bond, uh, and we're going to release pyrophosphate. Now, this is one of these strategies. So we're taking our molecule all the way down to the AMP level. And the reason that's beneficial is because this product vanishes almost instantly. It's cleaved um, to phosphate, very, very fast process. And so this product is immediately whisked away. So delta G is much more exergonic here because this other product is immediately removed. And so now we have a, uh, this weird sugar. So in our case, we're going to be thinking about glucose. And we're going to have a phosphorylation on that sugar. And that's going to be attached to an AM or a UMP. So it's going to be actually a UDP. But why this weird? Why Remember, we, we saw this before with galactose, where we were putting a UDP uh, and we're inverting that stereo center on galactose to make glucose. And so I mentioned at that time some of the benefits of doing that. One is the irreversibility of this. So as soon as we make that pyrophosphate, that thing is immediately cleaved. That product is gone, so the reverse direction is disfavored, starting from the cellular state. There's a larger thing to grab. There's this big UDP or NTP uh, to grab. And so that helps in the binding affinity, helps the catalytic activity to have something large to bind to like that. Um, it's relatively still reactive, so we're preserving its reactivity because hydro hydrolysis of that off or transfer of the uh, 
the NTP or NDP to another molecule is still relatively energetically favorable. Uh, and the big thing is it allows us to mark molecules. So you're going to see uh, two processes, Tay, the buildup of glycogen and the degradation of glycogen. The buildup reactions, we're going to have these tagged, these UDP tagged glucose molecules. But in the breakdown process, there will be no UDP tagging going on. So as soon as you put a UDP tag on glucose, that marks it for synthesis of glycogen. Okay, helps us to regulate these processes. Okay, and so here, remember um, glucose um, six phosphate. That's the product of hexokinase. But you might imagine if I'm going to want to make an alpha one four linkage, I don't want to make an alpha six four linkage. So really, what I need to do first is move this phosphate to that uh, hemiacetal position. I need that to be in the one position because I desire to make 1,4 linkages, not 6,4 linkages. So we take that glucose 6-phosphate, either from hexokinase or coming up from gluconeogenesis, and I mutagenize it or I, I convert it to a glucose 1-phosphate. And then when I have the glucose 1-phosphate, I'm going to put a UDP group on there. So I'm going to add the uridine monophosphate to the existing phosphate that's already there to make a total of UDP. So now we have UDP glucose and it's udp elated at the one position. Okay, and this is catalyzed by this UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. With me so far? So we've tagged our molecule. And now we have glycogen synthase. Very creative naming here. And so we have uh, glycogen, or we have our tagged glucose. And we're going to add that through this enzyme at the four position. So we're going to make a new acetal linkage between the one position and the four position, dropping off our UDP. And so this is a chain extending capability. We're not adding it to the one position, right? We're adding it to this four, this non-reducing end. We're extending it. Each cycle of this glycogen synthase extends that end by one residue. Okay, and so we're going to keep doing that. But to be able to start to do that, this enzyme, glycogen thin synthase, does not, not know how to take just one, two monosaccharides and combine them together. It just hasn't evolved that capability. It can only extend pre-existing non-reducing ends that are at least eight residues long. So we need something else, it's just how it evolved, to make this seed so we can then extend uh, with the synthase. And that seed is made by an enzyme called glycogenin. So glycogenin is not technically an enzyme in that it is not processive. So when it makes one, there's a single glycogenin protein per starch granule, and it never leaves the starch granule. So when you have glycogen starch, it's actually a mixture of protein and carbohydrate. And so let's look at this. So there's a tyrosine residue on the glycogenin protein. That tyrosine residue is attached to the first glucose. Again, we're using the same feedstock, this UDP glucose, and we're making this one linkage, the, the, the one position of the first sugar attaches to the hydroxyl uh, group of uh, a tyrosine amino acid within the protein. And then the, the same, so this is called uh, uh, glucosyl transferase activity of the glycogenin protein, and that glycogenin protein has a second activity, which is a chain extending activity. So the first activity puts the first sugar on to the tyrosine. The second activity makes uh, alpha-1,4 linkages. So it adds the second, the third, the fourth protein. It stops right around eight total uh, glucose molecules on there. But then it just stays. So you still starch granules have a glycogenin. Every single one at the center is glycogen attached through a tyrosine to that reducing end. So there's actually technically no reducing ends, right? Because this is an acetal, right? It looks weird. Yeah. <laughs> 
looks funny because it's coming out straight. So that's not re reactive at all. So we've primed it, and all we do is take our glycogen synthase. Once we've primed it with glycogenin, so glycogen is weird. It's binding, and it has two different activities, but it's not processive. So it doesn't like let go at the end and then prime another starch granule. The only way it's going to be released is if we completely degrade the starch granule. So here's the glycogen and protein sitting in the sea of... Uh, of a starch of, of glucagon or uh, glycogen. And so we also need branches. So if we have just glycogen synthase, we just have alpha 1 4 linkages. We need alpha 1 6 linkages to make branching. And so this is, enzyme is creatively called glycogen branching enzyme. So glycogen branching enzyme is weird. Look at what it's doing. So it takes a pre existing stretch of alpha 1 4 linked glucose molecules, it cleaves off such that this length is, you know, in the ballpark about uh, seven uh, s sugar residues long, and it transfers this stretch to the sixth position. And you might wonder, well, why does it pick the sixth position? I, mean, I don't know for sure, but I could speculate it probably has something to do with this thing hanging out on a methyl group. Remember the sixth position, you have that methyl group, you have the hydroxyl, and so it's very accessible. We're going to try to pack in as much as possible, but we don't want to make branches here and here because it's just, you wouldn't be able to stuff as much um, a starch into a granule. Okay, and so this branching enzyme is able to do this again and again and again. So glycogen synthase just keeps cranking along, extending here, and when they get to a certain length, we can branch, and then we branch and branch and branch. So this is not precise science. It's not like if you took a ruler to every stretch of glycogen, that it would be exactly a certain number of amino acids long. It has to do with when the branching enzyme comes about, say, oh, that's getting long. I better cut that and move it over there. So it's a general, the general average length. It's about eight. Okay? So this is it. This is the anabolic process that makes glycogen. We've now stored it. Okay? We're going to go backwards. Okay, we're going to go the other direction. And this one's pretty easy, right? So you just take your glycogen at your non-reducing end. You have an enzyme called phosphorylase, which is going to cleave um, that glycosidic linkage and replace with a phosphate, right? And so this is handy to have a phosphate because we can just take a mutase, move that to the sixth position, and off we are going to a glycolysis. So glucose 1-phosphate, it's like, uh, what's that? We need to move that first to the sixth position. But we're preserving some energy here by, in this single reaction, both cleaving the glycosidic linkage and adding the phosphate molecule. So this is a phosphorylis, phosphorylysis. And so here we have a bunch of non-reducing ends. This enzyme can work on them all simultaneously, clipping off one monosaccharide from the time, at a time from each non-reducing end. Uh, and then you, but you get to a certain point, and this glycogen phosphorylase just cannot deal with how packed things are near the branch points. So we need a debranching enzyme. And it looks almost like the opposite of the branching enzyme. So it takes a certain stretch right, and moves it over to a, a reducing end. But in this, it's a little different because it leaves one glucose. And this single glucose needs its own little enzyme, this glycosidase activity of the debranching enzyme, to cleave that off. Okay, so we have the transferase activity transferasing large stretches of sugar near a branch point, and then we have the glu glucosidase activity cutting off a glucose. Okay? So that's how we disassemble the thing. Obviously, we don't want to be making it, tearing it down, making it. You don't want this to be a circle. You would waste energy. So we need, again, coordinate regulation. Thank God it's a lot more simple than the last one we saw. So we have two key enzymes here, this phosphorylase and, and uh, uh, we have the uh, phosphorylase that we saw um, previously, and then we have the glycogen synthase. And again, these are regulated by conformational change induced by addition of a phosphate to amino acid within the enzyme. So we have the less active form that's dephosphorylated phosphorylase, and the active form that is phosphorylated. 
And the same with glycogen synthase, but it's the opposite. In the glycogen synthase, the phosphorylated form uh, is inactive, and the dephosphorylated form is active. And it makes a whole heck of a lot of sense that glucagon turns one on and turns the other off. Okay? So what is glucagon? Glucagon is a signal from the pancreas saying, we're running low on glucose. You know, stop making glycogen. Start degrading glycogen so we can bring our glucose levels back to a, a steady state. And we have insulin here also regulating this process. Okay? So this one's a lot more simple. We have a kinase and a phosphatase, right? And so the, the, the kinase is adding the phosphate to the phosphorylase, and the phosphatase is removing it. And the same thing here, we have a phosphatase removing the phosphate, and kinase is adding the phosphate. In this case, this one kinase activates another kinase that then adds the phosphate. Okay? So it's a lot more simple, but the same goal is achieved, coordinate reciprocal regulation of the degradation and the buildup of glycogen. With me so far? We're going to do something entirely different now if there isn't any questions. So I wanted to cover a little bit on the next lecture, lecture lipid metabolism. There's just a lot. Remember the lipid lecture? Just describing the structures. Took a whole lecture. We're going to look at some of the pathways that make all those structures. So we need more time. So I'd, instead of talking really fast next time, we're going to start with this now. We're going to talk about the catabolic processes that degrade fats uh, into uh, simpler molecules like acetyl-CoA. Remember tri triacylglycerols? You have ester-linked fatty acids uh, attached to a glycerol molecule. Uh, and so there's a, a lipase that cleaves these uh, fatty acids off. So that's the first step in the process. We have a lipase, and now we have fatty acids in solution. Um, the glycerol molecule that's produced one of the two products of the lipase. We have fatty acids produced and glycerol. Glycerol is sort of good, but it's backwards. So if we want to feed this into uh, glycolysis, this is the wrong stereochemistry. So we've, when we cleave off those fatty acids, we have the L prochiral stereoisoform. So here, this is L when we add a different substituent. So we have L glycerol 3 phosphate. And remember, we had a previous example where we had to invert a stereo center. Do you remember where we did this before? And do you remember how we did it? Does this look familiar? Nature has the same trick here. So first you oxidize it, same as in galactose. We're in, that's an epimer of glucose. We inverted that one stereocenter by first bringing it to carbonyl, which is sort of achiral, and then stereoselectively adding the water back. Okay, and so we first uh, transfer some electrons from this molecule to NAD to make NADH. We have a carbonyl group, and then we stereoselectively add the hydroxyl group in the D position. And so now we have d glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. We can feed that into glycolysis. We wouldn't have been able to feed in um, l glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The next enzymes wouldn't know what to do with that. Okay, so the same synthetic strategy that we saw with the galactose catabolism. Okay, uh, and so what we need to do here is activate. So we dealt with glycerol, just feed that right into glycolysis. Uh, and then we're good to go with that. But the fatty acids, we need to first activate them. And so we're going to, the end output of this is to make a new thioester linked fatty acid. And you'll see throughout the remaining slides, we have an R group. The R group is the fat, whatever it is. Right? So if it's palmitic acid, there's 16 carbons total in that fatty acid, represented, abbreviated as an R group. So we're going to do the same exact strategy, very similar to what we saw just previously with the UDP glucose. But here we're going to have an AMP uh, group attached to the, the fatty acid. So we have a phosphoester linkage to this uh, this, in this ester here. And then we're just going to swap in a coenzyme A. Remember, that has a free thiol, and that can make a thioester uh, linkage. And so this reaction, because we're going from ATP all the way down to an AMP equivalent, that produces a pyrophosphate. Delta G is very negative because pyrophosphate is immediately whisked away and uh, converted to two inorganic phosphates. And so both of these steps 
are exergonic, starting from the standard state. Okay, so all we've done so far is we have the same exact alkyl chain, fatty acid, but we've stuck it on to this large coenzyme A. So the net process, we've used an ATP, and we've converted that all the way down to the AMP form to activate the fatty acid. Okay, so fatty acid uh, catabolism starts in the cytosol, but think about what we're going to do. Fatty acids are a reduced form of carbon relative to sugar. And what we're going to do is feed this into the Krebs cycle. So we've got to radically decrease our oxidation state here. And so why not do that where we can very productively utilize that energy, catch those electrons? We could have done it in the cytosol, but then we'd have to ferry all those NADHs in, and that would be wasteful. Why not take the whole fat, stick it on a carrier, and whisk it in here? Okay, and the other advantage we have here is, see we have coenzyme A here? If we would just move, there's different ways we could have transported that. We could have just transported this thing in, but there would be this net movement of coenzyme A into the mitochondria. The alternative way is first transfer um, this fatty acid to uh, some other molecule, such as a carnitine. So here we have a thioester linkage. We transfer it to make a new ester linkage to carnitine. So carnitine is just a molecule that has some charges and that can be bound to these transporters. And also, coenzyme A is a bit big for being uh, transported, uh, and so it's, this is a bit smaller than coenzyme A. It helps in the transport process. So we then take our fatty acyl carnitine, transfer it into the mitochondria, and then release it, um, regenerating our thioester linkage. So now we have the full length of the fatty acid, and it's the same molecule, right? There has been some chemical transformations, but the end product here is the same molecule. We have our fatty acyl-CoA. And we'll learn in the next lecture that this is the point of regulation of this process. We'll come back to that. Uh, it's regulated by malonyl CoA, which is involved in the synthesis of fats. So we don't want to be synthesizing fats when we're degrading them. Reciprocal regulation, uh, regulation is a happy, good thing. Okay, so here is our oxidation. So here, we're in the furnace. Light the match, trans start transferring electrons. Do it in a controlled manner. We don't want to just woof and have a big puff of smoke, have this thing converted into acetyl-CoA. We want this thing to be gradually and systematically taken apart. And the way we're going to do this is by cleaving the bonds indicated in these blue lines. So this is beta oxidation. So we're going to take each of these bonds and cleave them. Is there any questions so far? We have a little pause. Uh, we're about to light some matches. It's going to get exciting. Any other questions? We're in the furnace. No? Wow. So it's pretty simple. There's only four steps. So this is a process called beta oxidation. So the beta, you know, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, da, 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 da. So beta is the second position. So that's why we call it beta oxidation. And you're going to look at this synthetic strategy. You're going to say, oh, nature is lazy. I've seen this before. So see if you remember. We first have a dehydrogenase transferring to FADH2 some electrons, making a double bond, a true dehydrogenase. So we're eliminating hydrogen, making a double bond. This is beta position. And then we're going to add water across that double bond. Does that sound familiar? And it's going to only be in the L configuration. Does that sound familiar? Then we're going to oxidize. So here's the flame is ignited. We've transferred some electrons to NAD to make NADH, right? And so we know what we're going to do with those. We're going to feed them into electron transport, complex one. So now we have a carbonyl group. And then in this next step, we're going to cleave at that beta position, releasing an acetyl-CoA and at the same time, simultaneously, adding a new thioester linkage to repeat the process. So all we've done here is we've taken out an acetyl-CoA and we've reduced the length of the fatty acid by two carbons. 
and we're just going to do this again and again and again. Right? So we're going to take, so if we start, depends on how many fatty acids or how many carbons in the fatty acid molecule you start with, but you're just going to take these out two carbons at a time, making acetyl-CoA. So where did we see this before? Look at this, I think I have a summary slide. Look at the synthetic strategy. Eliminate a hydrogen. <laughs> it's okay, I don't want, somebody else. Yes, ding, 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 citric acid. Remember that regeneration part where I had, I just remember I showed you some slides where I just show you the carbons doing the chemistry. First you make a double bond, then you add water making L-malate, right? And then you um, oxidize this to a carbonyl group, right? And then you convert it, or here you're doing something new, you're cleaving leaving this bond off. Okay, so it's the same synthetic strategy, and you've now converted these carbons to the oxidation state that's compatible with the Krebs cycle. This is where, so we're at the sugar, where we've removed um, these four electrons. One ended up on FADH2. Now, how might we regenerate the FAD? Can you imagine how that might happen? Do you remember an enzyme called succinate dehydrogenase? That's also called, see, we're integrating, man. Come on. We're integrating. What lecture did we learn about what happens to FADH2 in the name? Is it complex four? Two. Good. Complex two. And that one, where did those electrons go? Immediately succinate dehydrogenase right onto the ubiquinone to make ubiquinol. It's a two electrons are transferred there. Here, it's almost the same. It could have been that this enzyme was sitting in the um, intermembrane, you know, receiving, and, you know, FADH2 is generally not released. It just sits there as a tightly held prosthetic group. And, but in this case, we have a little mini electron transport chain. So there's actually three enzymes. So this particular enzyme is floating around with this FADH2. It docks with another enzyme, transfers those electrons to that enzyme, which also has FAD, making FADH2, and then it docks with the third enzyme, which is in the mitochondrial membrane, again with an FAD, converting it to FADH2, and then it goes into ubiquinol. Okay? So you have a little, so the net product is six protons moved, not ten, because we've short-circuited, we skipped complex one. For the NADH is made, those are going through complex one. Okay, and so we get the full ten um, protons moved across the bilayer. Does that make sense? Okay. And so we repeat this step, in. we say we start with palmatil coa so you have a total of 16 carbons. At the end of the day, you repeat it, taking two carbons off, two carbons off, two carbons off, uh, until you get to eight acetyl-CoA's, seven FADH2's, because the last one you have four left, you cleave from those four carbons, you just get one FADH2 and one NADH, and you have seven NADH's. So now we've brought this thing down to a manageable oxidation state, but Fatty acids come in to acetyl-CoA, so there's no going up to glucose. It's absolutely impossible. You can't go backwards, pyruvate dehydrogenase, cannot go through the Krebs cycle and pull off some malate. That just doesn't work. So we cannot live on these fats. They can only be used to make energy in something else called ketone bodies that we'll hear about in a moment. All right? Does that make sense? Halfway done! <laughs> Yeah, we'll see.